Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc. that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your keeper, Keeper Michael, and I have a very special episode for you today. As you've undoubtedly heard and seen, we are now running Horror on the Orient Express. And we're going to get to our first investigator introduction, which we are calling The Prelude. Will this week's investigator please introduce themselves? My character, full name and title, uh, and but what most people would know her by, uh, she's Lady Elizabeth Fitzroy. Everyone else would call her Lady Elizabeth. But to friends and family members and other people of the same social class, she is Elise, or Lady Elise, depending on who she's speaking to. But to servants, she's Lady Elizabeth, and to people who are of a lower class than she is, she's Lady Elizabeth, played by Rena Henze. We open today in London, specifically Kensington, and this January morning is a rather crisp one. Uh, you can tell because the family house is a bit drafty, and as much as the staff here have tried to shape things up since you've kind of taken control of this house. It's clear to you, even beneath the thick covers, that winter is here. And so, as you can roll about a bit in bed, trying to search for the warmest spot inside the mattress, you can hear that there is some sort of noise from downstairs. Something is happening in the house. Bennett? Bennett? What's going on? There's no immediate answer. Well, I sit up and look around. Listen for a moment more, see if there's... See if I hear anything else, if I hear any commotion, people moving around, anything like that. You sit up, probably a, a couple of heartbeats pass, and then you hear a voice outside the other side of the door. It's Bennett. Yes, my lady? What was that dreadful racket downstairs? Uh, uh, there's a there, there's a caller at the door, I believe. Uh, I, I'm having Mr. Hughes take care of it. Caller? What does he want? Uh, I'm not quite sure, ma'am. Do you need any help preparing? Uh, yes. If come in, help me get dressed. I'll go see what see what this person needs. If Mr. Hughes determines he's allowed entrance, you hear the door open, and um, you see Bennett walk in and shut the door behind. She comes over to the bedside and begins to attend to you. She she doesn't preen you per se, but she tries to collect you a little bit. She's a bit of a hen in that regard. <laughs> um, but, you know, with a, a quick movement or two, she gets you set where she wants. And then she says, well, she turns to the vast clothing collection you have. What uh, what would Milady like to wear today? Uh, let's, let's go with the green, I think, for today, Bennett. Feeling a little more colorful today. A good spot of color is good for the winter. She steps away and begins collecting clothes. You hear footsteps coming up the hall. You can tell the well-worn boots of Mr. Hughes are approaching. (laughs) Excuse me, lady. Yes, Hughes, what is it? Uh, It's a caller at the door. His name's, uh, well, he says, uh, he coughs a bit. You can tell the winter is beginning to get to Hughes. All of the in and out and in and out. Well, it's it's your it's your father's footman, William. He's here. 
William. You kind of harken back for a moment. William is was one of your father's oldest footmen. He gracefully retired after the Earl's passing. Raymond did not see fit to hold William in the, with the highest esteem like your father did, and uh, he allowed him to retire. Is, that's one way the family is putting it. The other way might be that he saw him off so that way he could have a, uh, a footman of his own. What does he want, Hughes? Uh, he, uh, I'm sorry, he said that he has an important delivery for you. Uh, I couldn't well sort it out, but he's got a some sort of satchel with him. That's dreadfully odd. Tell him I'll be down in a few moments. Uh, what, can course. you put him in the sitting room? Of course, my lady, of course. Thank you, Hughes. You, you hear his boots uh, trundle along back down the hallway. Bennett comes over with the green. Mm, this is going to look wonderful today. Yes, I rather think so. Contrast this dreadful gray. Uh, yes, it is England in January. Kind of muses a bit. Missing the countryside, are we, Bennett? Uh, well, with, between the pea soup and the... Oh, dreadful autos. Yes. I much prefer the countryside and the horses and perhaps a dog or two. Yes, I know, but we couldn't very well stay under Raymond's foot, now could we? We know how uh, you and Lady Margaret got along. She kind of looks down at the floor. I'm sure we'll be back in the countryside at some point, Bennett. I have plans for traveling at some point if I can ever get out of this dreadful, dreadful weather. Of course, she helps you up and into the uh, the dress. And then um, I guess the question would be is, do you believe Lady Elise would, would she use the wheelchair in the house or would she use braces in the house or how would she? She'd use her walking stick probably just to get around the house. And if she's having a particularly bad day, she'd ask for her braces, but not quite this morning, but definitely the walking stick, particularly for the stairs. So she gets you the walking stick and kind of helps you to your feet until she knows that you have your feet under you and then proceeds to assist you with any other accessories you might need for the day. No, not not those shoes, Bennett. Those are a little too uncomfortable. Just planning on staying in the house today. Comfort, dear, comfort. Right you are, my lady. She turns around and goes back and gets the different shoes. Thank you, Bennett. You are a treasure. Thank you. She nods and uh, prepares your shoes. You make your way down the hall. If it was drafty a bit in your room, the hallways are perhaps just a titch worse. Um, you can tell that something is going to have to be done about the windows in this place. Whatever your father did, or for that matter, didn't do while he had the place, it's going to have to be redone. Tell them to stoke up the fire in the sitting room. Please, Bennett. I'm feeling a bit of a chill. Of course, my She moves in through the, uh, the halls until she gets to uh, the sitting room. Where are you? Are you planning on going directly there, or are you going to go uh, stop somewhere first? Like, I would go directly to the sitting room, I think, so I wouldn't keep him waiting because it's probably giving Mr. Hughes some kind of anxiety over having a footman in the sitting room. <laughs> yes, there is a bucket of anxiety, mostly appearing as <laughs> Hughes waiting outside the door. And uh, you can tell from the way he grips his fingers against the insides of his palms. He is socially uncomfortable with what's happening. He realizes that there isn't much he can do about it, but uh, you can tell from that that um, he doesn't like the fact that a footman has just decided to show up at the house, unannounced. It's... Well, it's a laundry list of probable social faux pas, at least by Hughes' standard. Don't stress about it, Hughes. It'll be just just fine. I will speak to William and find out what he wants, and then we'll send him on his way. Of course, my lady. Would you like me to have um, Grace bring you something? Yes, have Grace prepare some tea and some biscuits, I suppose. Mm. We don't want to keep him too long. Of course not. Right away. He Thank you, Hughes. Opens the door. Uh, and then you see at the other end of the sitting room, sitting, although almost perched, <laughs> on the piece of furniture he's in as if as if 
William knows that he shouldn't be doing this. You see your father's former footman, William. He has a leather satchel at his feet, and he is looking out the window, kind of staring out through the glass uh, into the uh, London morning, or the Kensington morning, as it were. He turns his attention to you. I walk up and hold out my hands uh, gently. William, what a surprise. Takes it very carefully. <laughs> Thank you for seeing me on such a, a terrible social way. I, I apologize. There was simply no other way. Well, why don't you tell me what it's all about, William? I must admit that I'm quite interested in what brings you all the way out here. He goes to the satchel. Uh, but he doesn't pick it up. He, he puts his hands on it, but doesn't actually raise it. Uh, he seems to tap almost feverishly on the uh, flap of leather. The uh, Earl asked me to hold on to something, at least for a little bit, before he um, passed, you understand. Um, and uh, it's, it's something I don't... Uh, it's, it's something I don't want to trouble you with, but I've orders, and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, now I'm quite intrigued. What is it? He opens the flap with, a, again, a nervous, almost... There's almost a smell of... Um, sweat's the wrong word, but almost an odor of fear when he opens the flap. And he takes out a massive book... Uh, it's gilded in iron corners. It has a very sturdy and thick cover and back cover. It would it must be a, at least a fourth of an inch, maybe. Sorry, our UK. I don't really do centimeters. <laughs> They'll have to deal with that. Maybe a fourth to maybe a half an inch thick cover. So it's fairly sturdy. And you can see that there are two and then three big clasps on the outer edge of this tome locking it shut and he almost with a good shake to his arms he kind of offers it up to you uh, the cover itself is uh, a deep red uh, and there are flecks of what look like uh, orange in some of the outer parts of the cover itself there's no name on the cover itself there is simply a symbol and it's one you've not seen before but the the symbol itself are lines that seem to weave together so if you were staring at it directly and in an upright fashion you would see two lines which come straight lines which come from near the top of this symbol and then two lines from the bottom and then they intersect one set turns right and one set turns left and they form this double X pattern in the center of them. Interesting. And Lord Northbrook told you to give this to me? <sighs> he did. He goes into the pack and then takes out a letter. As soon as he flips it over and hands it to you, you see a wax seal carrying your father's crest on it. I was told not to open it. Uh, and I was told... There would be consequences if I did. Well, you were always very trustworthy, William. I, I'm sure Father never would have thought that you would have done such a thing. To, to be honest, my ladies, uh, it's riveted me uh, since I, he gave it to me in September. Did he say anything else when, when he gave you these? He just told me that um, uh, even though traditions being what they are, it was one thing was never to be found by Raymond. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Forget I said that, William. <sighs> said what? <laughs> Very good, William. She's going to look at the book and the letter, but she's not going to open them in the presence of uh, someone who is in service. So uh, she's going to set it down on the table next to her and, and look back at him. Grace comes in with um, the aforementioned and aforequested tea uh, and whatnot. She brings the tray and cart in and then begins kind of setting things where both can reach him. She 
eyes William for a moment, almost like, what are you doing here? She seems uh, taken aback, but in a very English way, as to not cause a stir with you. But your keen eyes pick it out pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> that will be all, Grace. Thank you. She turns and leaves. I do apologize for, uh, again, for causing a stir with the staff here. I understand that I'm not one to... Uh, I shouldn't... There, there was just no other way to contact you. Don't worry about it, William. You served our family long and faithfully, and I'm sure the staff can deal with one breach of protocol in all of these years. I should hope so. Well, uh, how are you, uh, how are you finding the place? He the looks around, desperate to change the subject. <laughs> I'm doing quite well, thank you, William. Uh, I trust that your retirement is is serving you well. You are comfortable. Uh, I am. I'm comfortable. Uh, the father made sure I had everything I needed. He was quite well in trusting me with his his care, and uh, he showed me the same. Uh, before we exited. God rest his soul. Well, whatever else you could say about Lord Northbrook, no one could ever say he treated his servants poorly. Oh, no. Uh, oh, we never received anything but the best. Uh, I've, I've heard stories. I'm sure you, uh, they get around all over the place, but he was good to us. Yes, I know. Well... Don't hesitate to let us know if you need anything, William. I would hate to think that you weren't being well looked after or that you were in any sort of of need in your retirement. Hmm. I will do as such. He stands up and takes the satchel. Um, When he stands up and picks up the satchel and gets ready to leave, he uh, gives you a, a bow. And then probably about half a second or so after that, the door to the sitting room opens you can see that uh, someone is very eager to see him leave. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hughes is uh, standing there, kind of a bit of a stuffed shirt at this point from all of the uh, huffing and puffing he's probably <laughs> done behind the door. And William exits stage right. Mr. Hughes steps in for a moment and says, Lady, is there anything else that I can get you now that uh, your caller has uh, left? No, thank you, Hughes. I, I think I'm fine, at least for now. I'll I'll ring for Grace should I need anything else. Thank you for handling the situation the way you did. I needed to speak to William as it turned out. Hmm. I know it was a great shock downstairs. Well, it's just... Of, of course. It won't happen again, Hughes. Don't worry. He nods and then uh, shuts the door and leaves you to the almost empty study as there is now a curiosity here which was not there before as soon as the door shuts I'm going to pick up the book and the letter and go sit in my favorite chair close to the window and pour myself a cup of tea and I'm going to open the letter first because I'm dreadfully curious as to what dear old father has left me so inside this carefully prepared envelope you find a piece of parchment which could only have been altered by your father's handwriting. It is definitely his, without question. The letter, as you begin to read and kind of unwrap its contents, seems to be rather curious and then rather upsetting. Should I read this out loud, Mike? Absolutely. Okay. Can't hurt, right? <laughs> My dearest Elise... It is clear to me, even though the future may be muddy with concerns over my condition, there is a problem I cannot solve from behind this desk. I cannot ask Raymond to attend to this, as his skill and talents are not of my own. I have known for many years that you were something more than your mother and the family understand. I intend to call upon that part of you for what is to come. I will leave this place. There is no stopping that now. I loathe to ask anything of you, but I know all too well how strong you truly are. In the coming weeks and months, there will be scandal for our family, one which I will not be able to shield us from. No matter what they say, I took no part in such practices or damning ceremonies. You will not have standing enough to defend the family by yourself, but this is what Raymond has been groomed to do. Any appearance of indiscretions could draw further suspicions, so take care to keep your house tidy and social schedule in order. The book which accompanies this letter should be kept sealed and put away. 
I understand you and I share a curious mind, but I beg of you, keep the latches set, just as William has delivered them to you. The cost is not worth the knowledge gained. Be at peace no matter what comes. That's essentially the uh, end of it. There is no back. It is not signed per se. Uh, All you have to go off of is that it is definitively his handwriting. Well, that's not at all suspicious. She's going to read through the the letter again and then uh, put it down and pick up the book and look over it very curiously. Upon deeper inspection, you can tell that the collected parchment paper that makes up the tome itself, I say tome only in regards to the size, is probably several hundred years old. It looks like it's been well kept, at least uh, from what you can see from the outside. The the pages were well taken care of. Um, They're not frayed uh, beyond the normal um, understanding that would happen over several hundred years of keeping it on a shelf somewhere. The binding seems to be fit. Uh, the, the texture that covers the front of the, uh, the book itself is not, um, it's some sort of animal skin, although it's tough to tell with uh, the dye that's been used on it to color it. It's tough to tell specifically what it is. You'd probably have to take it to, to a bindery or if you were desperate, you'd have to really compare it with maybe a, maybe a librarian might be able to assist you with it. Hmm. But the book's weight is probably a good two kilos. Well, so it's a, te- it's a, it's a, it's a, let's say a big math book, math textbook. <laughs> I'm going to hold the book for a few minutes, very thoughtfully, just look at it, think for a moment. Like, well, he didn't want me to look in it. But the thing is, if father hadn't wanted me to look in it, he shouldn't have told me not to. So I'm going to try and open the latches and see what's inside. It looks like there there are actual the latches themselves have some sort of riding clasp over them, so there is some sort of key that goes to it, but it's not attached on any sort of book ring or uh, it's not within the envelope itself. Hmm, that's interesting. It's likely they could be forced or they could be cut off. Uh, that's not impossible, of course, but uh, it's definitely sealed for the moment, unless uh, you're going to you know, hulk out on everyone and just rip the... <laughs> well, I suppose I could always find a locksmith or someone to make make a key for it if he could make an impression of the lock. Does it look like the kind of, of lock that a key could be made for, or is it some super specialist lock that has to be one specific key? It doesn't look like it's very specialized at all. It looks like it's a lock that, that was purpose-built. Mm-hmm essentially keep it from being randomly opened. You think maybe a, a tinkerer or a mechanic or something like that, or someone who knew, knows a little bit more about machines might be able to, to quite easily just uh, alleviate you of the issue. Uh, I'll ring the bell for Mr. Hughes. Right on time, Mr. Hughes arrives. Mr. Hughes, would you mind having a locksmith sent around, please? I have, uh, I have need of a key. Oh. Um, is it a key that we do? He, he immediately goes to like his pockets. Uh, is it not a key we need? No, have? Mr. Hughes. It's it's not a key to the house. It's something else entirely. Hmm, very well. Uh, I shall send for one immediately. Thank you. He ton, again turns and uh, exits. After he leaves, I'm going to pick up Father's letter and read through it again. And it's a little... A little puzzling, because it's far more sentimental than he ever was in real life. Uh, I I always had the feeling he saw me as some sort of burden on the estate. Uh, This is the nicest thing he's ever said, actually. You might come to the conclusion that it is possible that in his dwindling days there at the end, he may have gotten, he may have come to the understanding that much as you say, he was not as emotionally connected to his children as he should have been. Um, and then, while filled with remorse, wrote a letter evidently prophesizing something terrible would happen to the family name. It's unfortunate that he has not gone into greater detail about what that is, but uh, here you are. Well, this is a proper mystery. A little time passes, and 
you are alerted to a phone call that has come. So I'll go to the hall, which is where I assume the, the phone would be, since mm. that's where phones were usually kept in great great houses. So Yes, the hall. Yes. As it were. We don't have a we don't have phone halls anymore. It's, <laughs> it's very drafty. <laughs> Mr. Hughes says uh your brother is calling. Oh. Raymond never calls here. Very well, I'll be down in a moment. Take your moment, and uh, after getting properly prepared, you pick up the candlestick and the receiver, and you hear you hear your brother's voice. Now, your brother is slightly older than you. Yes, he's about six or seven years older than me. Raymond? Yes, at least how are you? I'm doing quite well, thanks. A little drafty, but you know how the house in London is. <laughs> uh, how many mice have you found? Only three so far, but I'm sure Hughes isn't telling me about the rest of them. Oh, he's a good man. Uh, I'm uh, almost sad that he's gone. I do so much love having my own staff here, finally. Yes, I trust they're doing quite well for you. I have not had a complaint yet, although I suppose I probably wouldn't hear about it. No, you certainly wouldn't. Not if they're well trained. <laughs> I have called to ask a favor of you if I can impress upon you something socially. Uh, there is um, there is simply a, a matter has come up and I cannot go to this event and I need someone to go in my stead. Oh dear. What is it? It's bookish and boring, which means you'll probably love it. Oh, I do like the sound of that. Are you familiar with the Maudsley Collection? Am I? <laughs> um, you had heard about something at the museum maybe a few years ago that it premiered. Mm-hmm. Um, but you had only heard about it being from uh, sent in from Central America and Mexico. You had not, uh, you hadn't seen it yet. You hadn't gotten down here. Your health had not allowed you to travel to the museum at that time. I've heard some things about it, Raymond, but I haven't seen it yet. <sighs> well, one of Father's... Uh, former associates and his bookish associates a what's his name here you hear the fumbling of papers uh yes uh, Professor Smith he is uh, asked me to attend with him at this collection and I just I simply cannot fit it into the schedule it's impossible of course you can't dear and while I would love to honor his relationship and friendship with our father, it simply just is not, I tell you, it is not the time. Yes, well, I suppose I'll be happy to go if it's books and things, as you put it. Uh, but Raymond, darling, you will owe me one. I'll owe you. Yes, of, of course. <laughs> what, whatever whatever you need. I'm sure that, I'm sure that we can provide something. Now, this uh, collection is um, something about artifacts uh, from... Central America. It sounds, quite frankly, it sounds dreadful. I'd rather be on horseback. Yes, I'm sure you would. And I'm sure the horses prefer you. That makes two of us. <laughs> uh, now, I will, I will say, just so you are not caught unaware, that it seems the professor and father had some sort of a friendship over time. I don't know the particulars of it, but both men were men of books and letters. And so... To be prepared in that regard. Oh, that sounds quite fun. Only you would think that was fun. Yes, well, one of us has to have the brains of the family. Now, you see here. <laughs> you know I'm just teasing, Raymond. I look forward to seeing you again very soon. If you need anything for the house at Kensington, let me know. Of course. Can you send around the arrangements for this particular party? Of course, of course. It's in a few days. You'll have time to prepare. I wouldn't wouldn't think to ask this of you if we were only a few moments left. Of course. Give my love to Margaret. I will. I will. She is uh, busy. All sorts of um, things are happening. And the children. Mm, indeed. Well, and uh, hopefully they shall stay as such. Well, for a few more years anyway. Yes. All right, then. Well, cheers. Have a wonderful... 
Thank you, Raymond. I'll see you, I suppose, in another month or so when I come down. Hmm. Indeed. He says goodbye and uh, leaves you with yet another mystery. <laughs> Mysteries are piling up today, my my. I guess I'd like to get a sense of what a normal day for Elise is like. I'm a very punctual person, so I usually rise around eight and take breakfast in bed on a normal day. Obviously, this isn't a normal day. And then I spend most of my morning working on various projects, some of the writing that I do or readings, taking notes. I might go go to the library or send Fraser to the library if I can't go myself. I uh, usually take a walk in the afternoon around the park or just down the street, get some fresh air and make any social calls that I am absolutely obligated to do. And I just follow my own fairly strict schedule. I don't like being lazy. Sure, sure. Now, you mentioned Fraser there, and we have not met yet, but he is part and parcel to how you move in certain situations. So perhaps you could give me Elise's view on Fraser. So Fraser was first my brother's valet, and then he was my father's valet when Raymond got his own. And he became my personal assistant after father died. Didn't want to leave him out in the cold since Raymond already had his own valet. So I brought him on and it, he helps me with a lot of very useful tasks, such as moving my wheelchair when I have to use it, uh, running errands, taking down dictation, particularly on days when I can't write or use my hands properly. And he keeps very boring people away from me. So <laughs> I, I find him quite useful, particularly in all of the social situations I find myself obligated to go to. And he's very loyal to my family. And uh, I, I look on him very fondly for his service to my family and the fact that he's chosen to stay on in my household when it's a bit of a change from being a gentleman's gentleman. Hmm. But I, I'm very fond of him. We will get to hear from him in a future episode. A about an hour or so later, uh, Mr. Hughes returns and says... Milady, I have uh, retrieved your locksmith. Ah, thank you, Hughes. Send him in. You see a, a man probably a bit younger than Hughes, but not, not too much younger than that. He's great at the temples. He has a bit of a slack jaw. He is dressed in a fairly common working uniform with a coat because of the weather. He doesn't look dirty. He looks more like an office manager in the sense that he has spectacles and he has what seems to be a collection of uh, hand tools. I stand up and hold out my hand to him. He uh, takes and greets you. Good day, milady. Uh, what seems to be the trouble? I'll show him the book. I don't have the key for this lock anymore, and I was wondering if you could make one for me. Hmm. He... Size. He looks at you and says, may I, the, may I touch the book? Of course. Careful, of course. He uh, gingerly steps closer to it and kind of turns the book so you can look at the side of it. We've got a puzzler here. He opens up his toolkit and you see him pull out a magnifying glass. And he puts it over the front of the lock, one of the uh, clasps, and then looks left and looks right and seems to peer uh, deep in it. And then he looks up and down, and he seems to be very um, exacting. He takes a couple of very thin metal tools out. Uh, they don't seem to be clippers, or they just seem to be strange pieces of metal with, with angles on them. You've never seen anything like this before. And he kind of probes into the upper and lower parts of it. Uh, I, I should be able to make a key for this. Yes, it I'll have to go to the shop, of course. Whatever you need to do. Just how quickly do you think you can have it done? Oh, um, maybe a day, if that's all right. That would be perfectly fine, thank you. He nods and collects his things. Oh, I shall, uh, I shall have it for you as soon as possible. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. He takes leave of the room. Oh, such a dreadfully long time to wait. Elise is slightly impatient. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. 
and the thing about the book and the binding is that it the locks are so tight on this book that there's not even a way for you to get a look at what's going on on the pages. And it's not as if you don't try to open the book. I mean, you 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 give in after a while and try to open it, but to no avail. Do I recall seeing this book in my father's library? You know, it's an excellent question for your afternoon tea. <laughs> it is one you pose to yourself several times. And it takes probably a good half an hour of mentally retracing the steps around your father's library before remembering that this book was one of a couple that sat behind his desk, not out for the general public to view. And what tips you off is not the clasps, because that part of the book never faced outward. It's the color of the binding itself. So the actual spine of the book is what you remember. Uh, now, it was part of a, a set that had a green, one that was seemed to be sheathed in green, and one was seemed to be sheathed in, in uh, just a regular black binding. Uh, but this book, now that you sit and think about it, was was part of your father's study. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, now I must look at it. There were very few books in father's study that I didn't get my hands on, and this was this was one of them. Hmm. And he sent it to you. And of course, like a good father, he's locked it all up. He was always locking things up. So what I'm going to do mm -hmm. is I'm going to hold you there. And next week, we'll hear from another investigator in our growing coterie for Horror on the Orient Express. Mm -hmm.